Hello and welcome. Very good to be with you and have your company. How dangerous can fiction really be? My guest today, a Turkish writer and political scientist, has been investigated by the authorities of her home country for simply writing novels. Accused of being anti-Turkish and inciting crimes through her writing, she has fought back and continued to defy her critics. Elif Shafak, through her fiction, including her latest novel, The Island of Missing Trees, covers politics, identity and the expectations of women. She has also won acclaim for defining the 40 rules of love. Now a British citizen, she continues to campaign for women's rights, both in what she calls her motherland, Turkey, and around the world. Elif Shafak, welcome. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you. Um, I thought we could start with what you call your motherland, Turkey. And do you think that people outside of Turkey realise how challenging the circumstances are inside it? I don't think many people realise that Turkey, as you know, has become a difficult place for anyone who deals with words. So poets, writers, journalists, of course, but also cartoonists, for instance, humour itself can also be regarded as dangerous when democracy is lost. So that makes it very difficult, you know, when you don't have freedom of speech, it makes the life of a writer difficult. Many people, of course, understand that it might be um, not that easy to question political issues, but sometimes people don't realise that it's equally challenging to write about sexuality, gender discrimination, um, child abuse. So all those issues can also be very difficult subjects to tackle. I, I want to come to the investigation of you in, in short order, but on that point of our view of Turkey outside Turkey, do you, do you think it's outdated what we think of as Turkey? Because what's happened has been quite gradual. There's, there's no doubt in my mind this is such a beautiful country. It's a very complex country. Uh, and I would, I would never associate the government and the people. You know, the civil society in Turkey is, of course, far more multi-layered, nuanced. Uh, but we do have a very uh, conservative government that has become more and more authoritarian over the years. Under Erdogan. So, under Erdogan. So what we've seen in Turkey is the country under Erdogan has been going backwards and declining into ultranationalism, Islamism, populist authoritarianism. When and where that happens, we will also see an increase in sexism, misogyny, homophobia. In my opinion, these things always go hand in hand. There must be many, though, who are in support. Or do you, do you see it as a mask? There are some in support, of course, um, but for all kinds of reasons. And as you pointed out, this government has been in power for a very long time. They came to power with liberal promises of reform at the time they were pro-Turkey's EU membership. Do you consider Turkey, I say you used to call it your motherland, but do you consider it your home? You know, what is your identity as far as you're concerned? Because you're someone who's paid a lot of attention to that. Mm. I, I care about this question so much. Identity for me, it's not a static, solid, single thread. You know, it's not a monolithic block. I want to think of identity as more fluid, more multiple. And I think as human beings, we all contain multitudes, like Walt Whitman used to say. The problem is we're living in a world that doesn't allow us to be multiple, let alone celebrate our own multiplicity. So for me, rather than identity, singular, what I care about more is multiple belongings. If I have a singular identity, if you have a singular identity, it's much harder for us to understand what we have in common. But the moment we understand and embrace these concentric circles of belongings, then we realize actually so much of it overlaps. You said of your own country, your motherland in 2014, I get a lot of criticism from the cultural elite and a lot of love from readers. The more you are read in the Western world, the more you are hated in your motherland. Do you think that's still the case? Has it got worse or got better in the intervening years? I wish I could say that, you know, we made a lot of progress in Turkey in terms of freedom of speech, but I'm afraid it's quite the opposite. In 2006, I was put on trial for writing a novel called The Bastard of Istanbul, which tells the story of a Turkish family and an Armenian-American family. And it deals with memory and amnesia. As you know, in Turkey, we have a very long history, rich history, but that doesn't translate into strong memory. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. We're a society of collective amnesia, and our entire relationship with the past is full of ruptures. And that void is filled in by ultranationalist and Islamist interpretations of the past.
So when this book came out, the novel came out, I was put on trial for insulting Turkishness under Article 301. This is an article in the Turkish constitution which has been used against journalists, against scholars, but it was the first time it was used against the work of fiction. And it was quite surreal as well because the words of fictional characters were plucked. They were taken out of the text and used as evidence in the courtroom as a result of which my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters in the courtroom. So your characters were on trial? My characters were on trial alongside uh, you, myself. Because you, you yeah. fought this? Yeah. And what happened? So that madness went on for about a year and there were groups on the streets, ultranationalists, spitting at my pictures, burning EU flags, because for them, anyone who questions official history is a pawn of Western powers. And then I was acquitted at the end of that. What toll did that have? on you? Because that, that sounds like it was something to really live through. It, it was quite unsettling. I mean, I, I, you know, I have to be honest to myself. It did shake me quite a bit, also because I was pregnant at the time. So the day I was acquitted, the next day I gave uh, birth. Wow. So just one day apart, the, the, the birth and the, really? and the acquittal. So, you know, that whole year was quite um, unsettling for me and it was not that easy. But of course, many people go through so much worse. So I don't want to put too much emphasis on that. And at the same time, I did receive amazingly heartwarming letters at yeah. the time from readers. Um, and, and the reason why I mention, you know, where we are right now is a couple of years ago in 2019, again, this time I was investigated for crime of obscenity, for writing about sexual harassment, for gender violence. I write about these issues because this is the reality of the land where I come from. And what happened with those investigations? Um, it did not turn into a trial, but uh, the very fact that police officers come to a publishing house, the very fact that they confiscate novels, works of fiction, and they take to a prosecutor is, is quite unsettling I mean, for I mean, authors. Your works are, are hugely successful and widely read around the world. They, when you started writing in English, I know that was a, a big deal for you. But again, you've been labelled a traitor for doing so, uh, making your name easier for Westerners to, to pronounce and all of that. But how much do you think you've been targeted because you're also a woman? It's difficult to be a novelist in Turkey because novelists deal with issues about identity, belonging, memory, amnesia. You know, the canvas of a novel is so nuanced. It's not easy to be a novelist, but honestly, I think it's much harder or it's, you know, uh, perhaps more difficult to be a woman novelist because additionally you have to deal with sexism and misogyny as well. What is going on in Turkey with regards to women is extraordinarily bad on, on many, many levels. I mean, you know, nearly every day a woman is killed, uh, the levels of domestic violence uh, and how actually it's not investigated is, is something that it cannot almost be stressed enough. The country leaving the Istanbul Convention earlier this year, no reason was given. That was all about uh, a document signed in Istanbul, uh, all about the prevention of gender-based violence. Uh, what, what is your understanding, just first of all, of, of why Erdogan walked away from that or, or his government did? Uh, we have seen an escalation in cases of femicides in Turkey. And there are so many other sh stories that go uninvestigated. For instance, there are, there are very suspicious suicides. Are they really suicides? Um, so it, this, is, this is an urgent issue for women and children and minorities in Turkey. But instead of doing something about it, instead of changing the laws, and instead of implementing Istanbul Convention, because signing it is not enough, you need to ratify, you need to implement it, put it into practice. So instead of doing all that, what the government did was the exact opposite. They also launched this very horrible smear campaign, misinformation, saying that the Istanbul Convention is actually against our traditional values. And then one night, at night time, the government decided to withdraw uh, its, you know, from Istanbul Convention without really consulting women, without really consulting the civil society. And ever since women have been bravely on the streets protesting, there are many women in Turkey who are incredibly strong and vocal and I have so much respect from, for them. And when you look at academia, media, medicine, you will find them everywhere. But except in one field where there are very few women, especially as you go up the echelons of decision making, and that's politics. And that makes a huge difference. So the ones who are making the decisions are usually very patriarchal, conservative, 
men. You, you use the word there, femicide, um, and actually not everybody uses it, but you know, nearly every day of the year a woman is killed, and that's only the, the people who are recorded, the women who are recorded in Turkey. Do you think it's important as someone who thinks all the time about what words to use, that that word is used and that it passes into common parlance? Yes, I think it's so important. We need to use the word femicide, we need, we need to use the word misogyny, but also we need to understand that hate speech directed against women is a crime and it leads to other crimes. So every case shows this. And I don't think I have to mention social media alongside the role of media in which, unfortunately, it's always women who are put under the magnifying glass. What was she wearing? What was she doing at that hour of the night? You know, why was she out immediately? Or why didn't she defend herself? Immediately we start questioning women. This narrative has to change. Um, and I think we also need to understand that, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we have seen an increase in domestic violence all across the world. There was a recent report that showed over, in over 40 countries the amount of abuse that women journalists, women politicians, any woman in the public space have been receiving has escalated. So tech companies also need to wake up to the fact that this is hate speech we're talking about and they need to take it seriously. Uh, with regards, of course, I mean, men receive an awful amount of abuse as well, but it, it is augmented differently uh, towards women and, and for what reason it is given. And, and I suppose ha how you can tackle that. I mean, some would say technology is just reflecting the ills that's already there in society. Uh, and it's actually for society to change as opposed to the platforms. Uh, but there has been a move away from that position. I, I, I think we need to talk about... Um take companies in, in a different way, in the sense that for me, particularly digital platforms, social media is a bit like the moon. It definitely has a bright side, of course. It does connect us. It does give, give people more voice, especially in countries where there are no media freedoms or in countries where there's no equal space in the urban public space, for instance, for women. Many young women can carve out a space for themselves in digital platforms. I do not belittle any of that. However, because we have over-romanticized the bright side of technology and because we had this tech optimism of early 2000s, which was so arrogant as well, because the expectation was, you know, if you bring Facebook and social media, every country is going to become a democracy. That's not true. Because of all of that, we urgently need to focus on the darker side of social media platforms. And we need to understand how they spread disinformation, misinformation and hate speech. To come to, you know, I mean, I would, the, the technology companies would say they are working on that. That is something they're now looking at or have been looking at. I mean, I was reading about your, your early life. You said that, that books saved you. Why was that? My parents were in France. I was born in France, but afterwards they got separated and my father stayed in France. And in the meantime, my mother brought me to Ankara, to Turkey, to a very conservative neighborhood, very patriarchal neighborhood. This was my grandmother's house. But grandma herself was interesting. She was a bit like a matriarch and people would come to her and her house was full of superstitions, um, you know, lots of stories of, of, the, of the Middle East and oral culture. Although most of my upbringing and my education was in Turkey, I think I also felt the need to start writing in English, even though, as you can hear in my accent, in my broken accent as well, um, I'm an immigrant in this language. English for me is an acquired language. It's a much more cerebral connection. My connection with the Turkish language is more emotional. But writing in English gave me an additional sense of freedom, and I needed that. To this day, I realize if, I, if my writing has more sorrow in it, if it has more longing or melancholy, I find these things much easier to express in Turkish. Really? But when it comes to humor, which I love, and irony and satire, I find them much easier in English. What language do you dream in? That's always the test. Do you dream, yes, in, do you I, dream in both? I, I dream in both. <laughs> I dream a lot in English. When I'm writing in, in English, of course, I dream primarily, mostly in English. But so I can, can dream in, yeah. You can change. I love asking people who, who yeah. know, speak a few languages where they are with yeah. that because it's a bit of a moment when you, you switch over. That's so true. And, and the mind is fascinating, isn't it? Because it doesn't recognise these national borders no. that we take for granted. You, so you can't You're start... not asked for your passport in your sleep. Not at all. So you can start the same dream in Turkish and end it in, in English. 
And it also fascinates me when I observe many immigrants or, or many families from complex backgrounds. Sometimes they like to express their anger or frustration in one language or yes. another. So that switch back and forth. It's so clever. In the latest book, The Island of Missing Trees, why or what was the moment you thought I'd quite like to write from the perspective of a fig tree? That was such a risk, to be honest. I was aware that it was a risk for an author because if it doesn't work, the whole thing collapses, the whole edifice collapses. But it felt right, like the right thing to do. Uh, and if I may take a step back, yeah. I've been wanting to write about Cyprus for a very long time. Which is what the book? Which is what, where, the, where the book um, partly takes place. Uh, and it's a beautiful island with beautiful people north and south, but at the same time, it's a very difficult story to tell. And as you know, as we're speaking, there's a, there's a border, there's a frontier partition line that literally separates Christians from Muslims, Greek Cypriots from Turkish Cypriots. So depending on whom you talk to, north or south, there are clashing memories and there are wounds and the wounds are unhealed. I couldn't find a gate into the story. I've been thinking, reading, researching, only when I found the voice of the fig tree, it allowed me to separate myself from these nationalistic boxes and take another look. And then I felt more free to tell the story. But about uh, what people don't say, that's also a theme in the book. And it's about what you don't say to your children, uh, how you protect them potentially from painful pasts, what you as a family have perhaps fled from or escaped from. You have two children and I, I wonder how much you've navigated that with your own children, what you say about why you really left when you left Turkey. You know, having your mother being heavily pregnant with you uh, while being investigated in the way that you've described to me today yeah. is extraordinary. Yes, these are not e easy conversations to have. I'm, I'm aware of that. At the same time, as a, as a novelist, I also love to be an intellectual nomad to the best of my ability. So I need to look at the story from the perspective of multiple generations. And the reason why I say this is because I think in many immigrant families or any family that comes from a complex background, there are these striking differences as you move from one generation to the next. The first generation are usually the ones who have experienced the biggest hardships, traumas, obstacles. And they carry those memories within, but they don't know how to talk about them, so they don't. The second generation, especially after a displacement, they're, they don't, they're not interested in the past. And understandably, they have to be forward-looking, they need to find their feet, build a assimilate, new life, yeah. you know, assimilate, tabula rasa, let's move forward. And therefore, it's the third or the fourth generations in these families, the youngest in these families, who are asking the strongest questions about identity, memory, their ancestors' journeys. And I find that very striking that sometimes you can meet young people carrying old memories. It's so true. Are, are you, have you made a decision then based on that to try and skip being the generation because you have moved uh, and, and changed that doesn't answer the questions or comes forward? Are you trying to disrupt that? I want to disrupt that. I want to you know, uh, understand those silences because I think silences keep us apart. And they also deepen and widen the existing hurts and inequalities. But stories bring us together. If we understand each other's stories, uh, then we can, we can feel um, someone else's psychology. I, I am someone who thinks about a lot emo about emotions. And I think we're living in an age of angst. And it's not easy to be young in this age. It feels to me like many young people, they have a, almost a scream building up inside and they want to unleash it at us because we are, they think we're destroying, rightly so, we're destroying this world for them. It's going to impact their future. So it's a moment of anxiety, fear, disappointment, bewilderment, anger as well. But I think rather than questioning these emotions, the real question is what do we do with these emotions? You know, what do we do with our anger? What do we do with our anxiety? Can we turn it into something more positive? There's only one emotion that really scares me, and that's the lack of all emotions. Mm -hmm. That's numbness. The moment we stop listening to each other, the moment we become indifferent. The indifference. You know, yeah. that's, I think, a much darker world. To that scream in. of anger has, has made me recall that I read, you're a heavy metal fan. <laughs> Is that how you release <laughs> belief? I love heavy metal. I always love heavy metal. Of course metal. you do. That's exactly what I thought when you walked in today. <laughs> do you really? I do. I do very much so since my early youth. You know, people don't expect a middle-aged Turkish woman to love heavy metal. 
but I do. Is that what you were listening to when you, you wrote as the fig tree? Yes, I do listen to heavy metal, particularly the subgenres like industrial metal, Gothic, more uh, metalcore, Viking, Scandinavian Viking's metal. Viking's my favourite. Yeah. I've literally got no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also penned the 40 rules yeah. of love. Yeah. What's the most important one? I think they're, they're all related. I, I think love is so powerful and it transforms us and we need to allow ourselves to be transformed. And I think one of the rules mentioned in, this, in the book was, um, is about freedom. You know, th where there's no freedom, there's, there's no love. So love is not about possessiveness. Mm. You know, my fiancé, my partner, my girlfriend, the emphasis is always on my. But it's not about ownership, love. Uh, freedom and, and love makes me think of your, your TED talk back in 2017, where just towards the end, uh, you said you've never been brave enough to admit that you, I think you said it in the past tense, that you were bisexual. No, I said I am. You say I am. But I never had the courage to say it To say it publicly. before that. Yeah. And I watched that talk and it is right towards the end and it's great to hear it in its full context. But of course, what was taken from that is you came out. Yeah, of course. Um, and you had been scared of, of yeah. the shame, the ridicule. Yeah. How has it been since? Um, it's, well, uh, unfortunately, again, from my motherland, the, the level of shaming, ridicule, hate speech, verbal abuse has been, has been awful. But I was ready to weather that storm and I wish I had the courage to come out earlier, even though it's very visible in my writing, even though I've always been very vocal about my support for LGBTQ plus rights, I never had the courage to say also this is my story. But about um, with regards to feedback or, or you know, the, the comments coming from listeners or readers from other parts mm. of the world, it has been incredibly heartwarming. And also from my motherland, uh, I, I, I need to add this, um, from families particularly uh, of children who are LGBTQ themselves or, or both young and older generations, there have been very heartwarming and very moving letters quietly whispering, you know, words of support. But I had to go through that, a lot of abuse afterwards. It's, it's interesting, I was looking at some of the, the feedback that was certainly public and, you know, there's the type that you described in terms of the, the anti, but there was also a sense of, as, as, as I believe you're married to a man, um, why did you need to say this? We're, we're beyond being, a, you know, being able to be in a position where you have to come out anymore. But of course, different parts of the world and different parts of society are at such different stages of that, aren't they? And I wonder, do you still, do you still think today it's important to be able to say those things or do you think we're post that in some way? I think it's always important to, to share our stories. Um, and w one of the things that happens to us is when you live, you know, when you deal with authoritarianism, when you deal with any ideology or structure that divides human beings into boxes and denies their freedoms, what happens is people feel very lonely People feel like, am I the only one who's feeling this way? But when you hear someone else's story, then you realize you're not alone. And that is very important. There are amazing uh, authors from LGBTQ plus communities, authors, poets, speakers, who have given me amazing energy and, and motivation and inspiration. So I felt like I, I had a responsibility to share this, primarily to myself, but also to anyone who, who might be feeling alone. Elif Shafat, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, it was me fascinating. Too. Me too, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And until we meet again, mask up, stay safe and goodbye.